look at verse, beginning verse 13. And he went up on the mountain and called to him those he himself wanted. And they came to him, and he appointed twelve that they might be with him, and that he might send them out to preach, and to have power to heal sickness and to cast our demons. May the Lord richly bless you and give you his word. May you sanctify my heart. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again for this opportunity to come, be with your people, once again to open the word of life, your holy book, the Bible. We pray the Holy Spirit will anoint us to preach, anoint us to hear and to receive, that we might be the stronger, the spiritually enriched, because we've been under the word of the Lord. Open the heart of that man, that woman, that boy or girl, never come to faith in Christ. And maybe today they might say, what must I do to be saved? In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. I want to talk to you this morning just from this simple subject of one life to live. One life to live. Those of you who went to the movie this past Wednesday night to watch the movie Won't Back Down, starring Viola Davis, you may remember that one scene in the movie when she was sharing with her friend something her mother told her. And what her mother said to her was, what are you going to do with this one life? that you have to live. Another one of my favorite movies in recent years was The Great Debater, uh, starring the black Clark Gable, Denzel Washington. If you remember, he was this college professor at this small school down in Texas, and he was teaching his students how, how they might be able to debate more effectively. This is based on a true story. And he asked to produce the greatest debate team in the country at the time, and they defeated uh, the esteemed debate team at Harvard University. And you might remember the, the, the preacher in that movement, he would tell his son, he said, what do we do around here? And he said, we do what we have to do so we can do what we want to do. And his father would say, then go do what you have to do. It meant go get your studies and your, uh, your homework so that you will be able to do what you want to do because you've done what you had to do. So in this life, we have but one life to live. And it behooves us, you know, pretty quick to figure out what it is that we want to do with this one life that we have to live. This is the real deal. This is not some dress rehearsal. We cannot hit the remote control rewind button and back up a day and go back a few months or a couple of years and relive that time. Every day the clock ticks. This one life that we have to live is counting down. It is expiring, and we're moving toward our own end. Even though the world may not end in our lifetime, we're moving toward our end. It behooves us all to give serious consideration to what is it that I believe that God has called me to do with this one life that I have to live. The reason that question is so important is because we are inundated every single day with messages in this media-crazy age in which we live trying to prioritize our lives for us, to try to convince us that this is important or that is important. And if we're not careful, we'll find ourselves being carried away by a lot of trivial, insignificant, disconnected activity that does not really take us where it is that God would have us to go, nor does it take us where we will find the fulfillment and purpose that God intended for us to have. And so all of us have to deal with the mundane minutia. We all have to do stuff that we don't want to do and that we don't necessarily like to do. When we do those things that's our responsibility to do. We do what we have to do so that we can get to what we want to do to do what we believe that God would have us to do. And so we need to give serious thought. What are we going to do with this one life that we have to live? I think this is a fitting subject for this text that deals with the calling of the twelve. These men were already fully engaged in their careers. They were already fully engaged in activity. They were entrepreneurs, Peter, James, and John. They were professional fishermen. 
James and John, his father, Zebedee, had a fairly lucrative fishing business because he actually had his own boats, his own nets, and he had hired servants. So they weren't exactly in the welfare line. They were not looking for something to do. They were not idle people. Matthew had become pretty affluent, though someone somewhat clandestine, because he had extorted the people. He was a tax collector. He worked for the Roman government. And that was a very, very uh, prolific occupation because Rome gave you a quota which you had to collect. Anything you collect above that, you got to pad your own pocket. And so Matthew was doing quite well for himself. Then you had a character in the group by the name of Simon the Zealot, and we kind of pass over that. The Zealots were terrorists. They were domestic terrorists. They were insurrectionists. They were trying to overthrow the Roman government. They hated the fact that the Jewish people were an occupied state by the Roman government, and so Simon had his own plot and his own plan, and they were trying to overthrow the government. So all these guys already had something they were doing. And Jesus called them, and he told them to follow him. And they dropped what they were doing to follow him because it's obvious what they were doing were not giving them the sense of fulfillment, purpose, and meaning that they long and desire to have. And it's important that we understand that when Jesus was here doing his earthly ministry, he spent his entire life, well, almost an entire life, in the confines of the boundaries of the nation of Israel. And Israel was an extremely religious people, unlike our secular society today. They were an extremely religious people. They still practiced the Jewish temple worship. Their lives were filled with the Jewish customs and the Jewish traditions. They still observed the Jewish feast days and holidays. They still had the systems of synagogues that littered the land. They were extremely religious, so they were preoccupied with religion, and they were preoccupied with their religion, the Jewish faith. And they were looking and longing and hoping for their Messiah, their deliverer to come, who would throw off the iron-clad yoke of the Roman government reestablish Israel as an independent, autonomous nation, and they would enjoy the glory that they'd experienced under David and King Solomon. So we got to understand that. These people were religious, and they were open to religious instruction. And they read the Bible, and they knew the Bible, and they were biblically illiterate, and they were very familiar with their biblical history. That's unlike today. We live in a biblically illiterate society. We live in a society where people don't know the history of the Christian faith. They don't know the stories of the Old Testament. They don't have a clear understanding of the gospel. And we do not live in a, in a, in a country today that really is filled with a intimate knowledge of religion. And so we got to be careful so many people understand what it is that we're talking about. And we also have to be careful so many that people are interested in what we are talking about. We literally have to earn the right to be heard because in many quarters, we are viewed as being the non-intelligentsia, the simple-minded, the fundamentalist in terms of Bible uh, thompers, and that we don't entertain intellectual thought or have meaningful conversation apart from the initiated conversation we have around the Bible. And so it's important that we kind of understand that. We're in a day and age now where we have to earn the right that we heard, and we got to demonstrate that the Bible speaks with clarity and clarity to the issues of the day and that the church is relevant to the contemporary experience of people in the United States of America. So with that understanding, the Jewish religion, it was relevant. It was embraced. It was understood. So they didn't have to fight to be heard. And so when Jesus comes along and he's expounding on the Jewish Bible, the people were following him like bees around a, a beehive. They long to hear better interpretation, more insight. And so immediately his authority rose because he taught with such power, with such clarity, and, and with such insight. And so now he has this huge following, as we saw in uh, the pre uh, previous few weeks. And just quickly by way of review, and I want to talk this morning in some generalities because we're going to look in specificity over the next couple of weeks at these 12 men that Jesus chose from among hundreds of disciples, that they might become his apostles. Last week, we saw the priority that Jesus uh, placed on prayer. And you get a more insightful understanding in Luke chapter 6. In Luke chapter 6 and Luke chapter, uh, verses 12 and 13, 
Luke is sort of recording the same event that Mark records in Mark uh, 3, verses 13. It's a part of the synoptic, the similar uh, recording by Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And so in Luke chapter 6, verse 12, you would find these words. And it came to pass in those days he went out to the mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. So Jesus pulled aside from the masses of folk who were pressing on him, who were pressuring him for healing and for miracles and prays all night. And the purpose of this prayer really was to pray to the Lord for a divine direction as he selected those whom he would bring into an inner circle that he might teach and instruct them. And then when it was day, he called his disciples to him, and from them he chose 12 whom he named apostles. And then it lists them. So this is important. This is the calling of the 12. Now you know because if you've been here the past several weeks, by this time in Jesus' ministry, he has hundreds, maybe even thousands of people that are following him. He's extremely popular, particularly in the northern part of Israel, in Capernaum, of Galilee. So he has thousands of followers that are pressing after him. He recognized the scope and the magnitude of this work, and he, he, he understands clearly that he must have help to do this work that God has given him to do. Not that he couldn't do it by himself, because he was Jesus of Nazareth. He was the Son of God with omniscience and omnipotence and omnipresence. But as a man, he limits himself to time and to space, and with telescopic insight, looking down the corridors of time, Jesus knew that he would be leaving and would be gone for at least 2,000 years, and that God's work would continue, and the work of God would be entrusted to the local church. And that local church would be the custodians of God's truth, the visible, visible manifestation of God's work, and the continuation of the life of Christ in local neighborhoods. And so to do that, he would have to have people that he himself had trained it, had trained. They in turn would train others, and there would be a succession of disciples that would be trained to maintain the church until Jesus returned. But an interesting nuance here that Matthew records, that Mark and that Luke record. Specifically, he says he called from his disciples. Now, the word disciples in the Greek text, it simply means a learner, a pupil, a student. So everybody was following him and that was listening to him and that was learning from him, they were called disciples. They were followers of Jesus. All of the esteemed prophets or esteemed teachers in Israel would have disciples. John the Baptist had disciples, and John directed his disciples to follow Jesus because John knew that his ministry was coming to an end. So he says he calls 12 of his disciples, then he gives them another title. He calls them apostles, a total different term. And the word apostle is derived from a Greek word which means the sent one, who he calls from his pupils, his students, learners, 12 that he would give himself to, and those 12 would become the, the sent ones of the apostles. And so that they get this distinction. They are distinguished from the, the regular group of followers, pupils, learners of Jesus, and now they're going to have the distinction as apostles, those who, whom Jesus chose, who invested three and a half of his, his years of his life into, to equip them to establish leadership for the church. And as a way of background and getting a firm underpinning and infrastructure, what we're going to talk about in the next several weeks, look over in Ephesians chapter 3. In Ephesians 3, the Apostle Paul even gives greater insight into the purpose of the 12 and also the importance of the 12. Now, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they give details about the calling of the 12, and you find similar words in Matthew chapter 10 about how Jesus called 12 out from his disciples, called them apostles, and he's going to send them forth. Now look at what uh, Paul shares with us in the book of Ephesians. In Ephesians uh, chapter 2, if you were to back up with verse 14, he says, for he himself, speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ, is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the new wall of partition between us. Paul is describing what Christ did on the cross in his shed blood that he broke down the separation between Jew and Gentile, this partition that divided the Jew from the Gentile. 
and bring Jews and Gentiles into one new body that will be called the church. And Christ has abolished in its flesh the enmity that is the law of commandments containing ordinances as to create himself one new man from the two, thus making peace. This is great theological discourse here. Paul has talked about the uniqueness of the church, that the church will not be a cultural, it will not be a social, it will not be based on geography, but it's a spiritual organism that God has created. And everyone who's put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ are baptized into the church, and there is but one church, the church universal. Then the church universal is manifest in the local church where there is no distinction. People are equal before God in their value and in their essence and in their position in the body of Christ. Verse 16, and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. So again, this hostility that existed between God and man, it is done away with in Christ because Christ has borne the stigma, he's borne the punishment for our sins, and the, in, the, the, the enmity, the hatred, the bitter resentment that existed between Jews and Gentiles is also abolished in Christ as he's reconciled them together in one body. And he became our, and he came and preached peace to you who were afar off. Paul is talking about the Christ came and preached peace to the Gentiles and also peace to those who are near, the near ones being the Jews. For through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father. Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. This is deep. You need to read it, meditate on it. God will give you understanding. Paul is saying to these Gentiles in Ephesus, which was a cesspool of immorality, sin, corruption, and decadence, the Jews despised them, hated them, and resented them, called them lower than dogs. But Paul says to these Gentiles, you will put your faith in Christ. You're no longer foreigners. You're no longer strangers. You're no longer the outscouring of the world. You are now equal in the eyes of God as any Jew who put their faith in Christ. And then he goes on to say, but this is the important point that I want to make from this text. Having built on the foundation, watch this. So what Paul does, he says there is one foundation of the church, and that foundation of the church is the apostles. The 12 whom Jesus chose, they are the foundation for the church. Jesus chose them to serve as the foundational stones of the church. Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone. Jesus Christ is the underpinning, but he's built the first layer of block. If you're laying a foundation, you dig out the earth and the soil, right? You pour in the concrete to create the footer. That's the, the underpinning. And then you have a course of block that you put on top of the concrete footer. Jesus says the apostles are the first course of block. And everything that has come after them, is built upon them. Are you following? That's why these guys are so important. It's so important that we understand the significance of the apostles, these 12 whom Jesus chose. And then he goes on to talk about the prophets, the apostles and the prophets, with Jesus himself, Christ himself, being the chief cornerstone. And so now what you see here, Paul is emphasizing the importance of the apostles in the life of the church. By the time that Paul is sharing this, they are all dead. The 12 are dead, maybe with the exception of John the Beloved. But Paul is establishing is that their role is extremely important for the church and for the history of the church. Now look at uh, chapter 3. In chapter 3, Paul is talking about the mystery of the church, that the church is this sacred secret, this hidden mystery in the Old Testament. And that God is now unveiling, he is revealing to this generation the mystery of the church. And then in verse 5, he says, Which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to the holy apostles and prophets. So again, Paul is saying is that the apostles got this new revelation that no one else ever had had before God revealed it to them this mystery of the church. The Jews and Gentiles will be reconciled into one body. And then lastly, as we establish this importance of the apostles, look at uh, ch chapter 4. In chapter 4, Paul is describing 
what the Lord Jesus Christ did in his death on the cross, in his burial, and a mystery that happened with his resurrection. Look, if you would, at verse 9. Or verse, verse 9. Now this, he ascended. What does it mean but that he also first descended, speaking of Christ in his death and in his burial, he descended into the lower parts of the earth, he who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. And he himself gave some to be apostles and prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipment of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness by which they lay in wait to deceive. So again, Paul is establishing the priority of the holy apostles. He says Christ and his death and burial went into the lower parts of the earth. He relocates a Hades. He gathers up those saints who have died in faith, believing that God was going to send a Messiah. And in his ascension, he fills the church, and he gives the church the apostles and the prophets and the evangelists and the pastors, teachers. He's talking about these gifted positions and gifted people that God has given to the church over the church's life so the church can continue to be nurtured and matured and developed and perfected so the church can come to the fullness of the measure of the stature that belongs to Christ. And so the, the church is not manipulated, it's not spiritually hoodwinked, it's not spiritually bamboozled by trickery and wizardry from the pulpit because God gives gifted people to the church to enlighten people to what the Bible really does say, what the Bible really does mean, and how the Bible is to be applied. Now, all this might be boring to you, but for those of us who labor in this book, it's important that we understand there is some logic to how this thing is laid out, and there is some logic in the role that we have, those of us who handle the Word of God on a consistent basis, that we're in this successive line of those early apostles and prophets and pastors and teachers, and God has sustained the church for almost 2,000 years through this simplicity of giving gifted teachers to the church, to the body of Christ. And that's why it's so important. And that's why it's so important that those of you who have the gift of teaching, you find somebody to teach. You don't have the prerogative, if God has given you the gift to teach something from the Word of God, you don't have the prerogative to stand and sit on the sideline. You find somebody to teach if it's one person. Tell them what you know. You know the way I became a Bible teacher? I became a Bible teacher by being a pupil, by being a learner. But I've been a learner at Mount Calvary Missionary Baptist Church under Pastor Harold Middlebrook in 1978 when I got saved, relocating to Charleston, West Virginia, sitting under the ministry of Pastor Franklin Murphy and uh, Pastor, my pastor with Deacon Frank Strada. I went to every Bible study, every Wednesday night, every Sunday school. I still have the notebooks, notebooks, sparrow notebooks of notes that I took from their teaching. I studied what they taught me, and every Monday morning, I told somebody something I learned on Sunday. The best way to learn something is to tell somebody what you've learned, because then you've got to think through what you heard. You've got to really decide, did I really understand it? And then you've got to come up with words to make sentences to communicate it. And then when you hear yourself communicate what you think you have learned, you know whether or not you really know it. We don't have the right to sit on our gift. We don't have the right to sit on our gift. And for me, finding my gift was easy. It was just work. Just, just, just work. Just, just work. Help somebody. Pray for people. Teach people. If you work, you're going to find what your gift is. Find out what needs to be done and then try to do it. And if you're good at it, it might be your gift. If you're not good at it, it's probably not your gift. If people are blessed by it, it might be your gift. If people aren't blessed by it, it's probably not your gift. The only way to find what your gift is is to do something. It's to do something. And as you start to do things, you find the areas where God has gifted you and where God can use you, but just prayer and meditation won't get it. you got to do something. And so these gifted men were about doing things. So the Lord calls them. Now go back to Luke, where we were in the Gospel of Luke. And uh, we're going to lay the foundation this morning. We're going to build on the foundation in coming weeks. Because Luke says something similar to what Matthew says. He says something similar to what Mark says. Look at Luke chapter 12 again.
And I want you to turn, uh, turn back to Matthew, I'm sorry, I really want you to go to Matthew chapter 10. And, and Matthew makes this point, and then we're going to settle in in uh, Mark 3. But Matthew makes the same point. Look at what Matthew says in Matthew chapter 10. He's describing this same scenario where Jesus calls out of his disciples 12 to be with him. And in Matthew 10, 1, look at what Matthew says. And when he had called his 12 disciples to him, Luke adds that he called apostles. He gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. So he's been instructing them, he's been teaching them, and now he calls them out. And again, the word that is used here to speak of his calling is from the Greek word proskaleo, a com compound word. The first word pros means face. Kaleo means to call. So he, in essence, it says he's called them to his face. He called them toward himself to be in his face. That's the graphic interpretation. He wanted them to be in his face so that they could see his mouth and hear his voice and see his expressions and understand his conviction. He calls them to himself, to be close to him, to be attached to him. And for the next three and a half years, basically, their full occupation was to be disciples, learners, and then he would send them on certain missions as apostles. He would then bring them back, and they would give account. This was the most important thing that Jesus did in his entire earthly ministry. The most important thing he did was the selection of the 12. Because it was to this 12, he was going to commit the entire ministry. It was going to be in, instructed, it was going to be basically entrusted to them. After his death, burial, and resurrection, they would be entrusted with the ministry and with perpetuating the vision that he had launched. Are you following? Now you see why these guys are so important. They, they are extremely important. And so then when you look at this cast of characters, you realize that Jesus had to be divinely omniscient because he saw not only what they were, but only Jesus knew the potential that he had placed inside of them. There was nothing about them individually that would have credentialed them and made them attractive for this role. They were not advanced in terms of being educated. They were not advanced in terms of their theological training. They were not a part of the, Le the Levitical priesthood. They had not been to the school of the prophets. They were just simply common, everyday people. But Jesus knew the potential that they had once he had discipled them and once he would infuse them and fill them with his power. So he literally selects a cast of characters, some of them absolute misfit, misfits. I've described some of them to you. Matthew was a crook. He was an, an extortionist. Simon the Zealot, he basically was an insurrectionist. He was trying to overthrow the government. In that cast of characters, you had James and John. And we get this great, sanctified, and sanitized version of James and John. Jesus nicknamed them boys sons of Boanginese, which means sons of thunder. They were hell raisers. And it came out in the text. They following Jesus. And Jesus, somebody's casting out demons, but they're not with James and John. And they ask Jesus, can we call down fire out of heaven and consume them? That's the cast of characters that he had. While Jesus is going on this mission of mercy and healing and trying to show love and compassion, they're arguing and fighting and debating as to who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom of God. They were selfish. They were narcissistic. They were self-centered. James and John were so clandestine, they went and got their mama and had her to go to Jesus to get him to promise her that he would give them these special places in the kingdom of God. They tried to pull the ultimate coup. And then Nathaniel was just a self-righteous bigot. As a matter of fact, when they came and told him that they had found Jesus the Messiah and he was from Nazareth of Galilee, Nathaniel says nothing good can come out of Nazareth. He wiped off the whole village. 
as being insignificant and inconsequential Jews and Gentiles because he was a self-righteous religious bigot. These are the people that Jesus chose because he understood the potential that they had. And one thing they had, they had conviction, sometimes misdirected, sometimes wrong, but they had fire and they had commitment. Peter would curse you out at the drop of a hat and then try to cut your head off if necessary. And Jesus knew that that type of unbridled energy and passion, once it's brought under control and once it is directed to build God's kingdom, is unstoppable. So he chooses this cast of characters from his disciples. And I'm sure that some of the people that were looking at him would say, what type of holy man is he? Why would he call people like that to be a part of his inner circle? Why would he do it? He must not really understand how things get done. But these guys were something. And we see as we get over into the book of Acts, after the death of Christ, after his burial, after his resurrection, and after the Holy Spirit comes, these guys become absolutely incredible. They become bold. They become courageous. They become theologically insightful to, to preach and teach the word of God and apply the word of God. And now the trained Pharisees and Sadducees and scribes and chief priests, they are just taken back. They can't believe where did these guys come from. We know them. They're from Nazareth of Galilee. As a matter of fact, except for Judas, except for Judas, the other 11, see, they were all from the north. That was the unsophisticated part of Israel. They were all from the Galilean province. That's where the common people were. They weren't even from the Judea province down in the south where the big city of Jerusalem was. So there was nothing about them, their culture, upbringing, their pedigree, their education, their theological exposure, nothing about them that would suggest that they could carry a movement. Judas was the only one that was somewhat sophisticated, fairly well educated, fairly well trained, the only one in the group. And he was a crook. But after they encountered Jesus, they started doing kind of incredible things, preaching with power, people being converted, the power of God falling all over the place, and the religious leaders get, them set, get together, and they're, they're, they're talking, and they're discussing, and they're trying to figure out how could this be, and there's only one thing that they could come to, one conclusion. There's only one thing they all had in common. All 12 of them had one thing in common. And you know what that was? They had been with Jesus. <laughs> That's what they said. They have been with Jesus, and they said, this bunch of misfits are now turning the entire nation upside down, and they only conclude that they have been with Jesus. These men had one life to live, and they chose to hitch their wagon to Jesus' star and let him carry them wherever he wanted to take them and whatever he wanted to to do with them. Well, I'm out, about out of my time. I want to make just one sort of practical uh, application here that will be somewhat insightful, I hope. The reason I tried to get many of you to go to the movie was so that we could have a shared experience, experience something together, feel something together have a collective emotional experience on an issue, and that issue being education. You see, in the Bible, it says that Jesus gave them power, didn't he? He gave them power, and the power that he gave them was to bring about some consequence in the society, not at the church building, because as a matter of fact, they didn't have church buildings then. They came several hundred years later. So the Christian expression of God's kingdom for decades was a movement that was in the marketplace that gathered in houses for instruction, for prayer, to observe the, observe the Lord's table. But for the most part, they spent their lives in the marketplace trying to win people to Christ and then disciple them. So what is needed today, as I shared with you earlier, in our culture today, people are not basically knowledgeable of the Bible. They're not really that spiritually inclined. And so there really is a need for the church to demonstrate not only authority, 
but also to demonstrate power to bring about influence or consequence in a way that people recognize the church's engagement. Engagement. Let me explain to you what I mean. In my humble opinion, there are three pillars that hold up the American society. Three basic pillars. The first pillar is the nuclear family. It's the family, the basic building block of society. And so the family is the major pillar in any society and any culture that perpetuates itself over time. The second pillar, in my humble opinion, in the American experiment has been the church. Unique in terms of its stature, unique in terms of its influence, because the church in America really was established to be an extension of the family. And so it was to create a social family of like-minded people who had a common vision of expanding God's kingdom, of bringing their children up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord to glorifying God and seeing God's kingdom spread over the earth. It's an extension of the family. The third pillar, in my humble opinion, in the United States of America's experiment is the public school. Unique in a lot of ways because few nations have made a commitment to educate the masses of people the way that commitment was made in the United States of America. And it wasn't an original commitment. In the beginning, education was not for everybody. It was, it was limited to the elite with those with money and resources. And again, you know what institution it was? It was the church that led the charge to expand who got educated, to expand who was literate. You know why? Because the church had this noble goal. How can we have effective disciples of Jesus Christ if they are illiterate? If they can't read the text, if they can't read the Bible, how can they know what God is saying? And how can they be effective witnesses and evangelists? So the church led the parade in terms of trying to expand who got educated for the purpose of creating biblical literacy. And that's why the great schools like Harvard and Yale and Princeton and most of the Ivy League schools, they were not originally established to be bastions of liberal thought. They were uh, established as theological training schools because the society recognized that the ministers should be elite thought leaders if they're going to shape the moral conscience of the nation. That's how where we've drifted from. And so now these institutions have become by and largely secular in some ways hostile to the gospel of Jesus Christ, and even in the context of the local church, the local schools, how God has been excommunicated out of the public square. We see it right here, right now in Kanawha County with the situation up in Sissonville, where these people say, no, we're going to pray at the ball games, and now the ACLU and others say, no, you're not going to pray. They say, no, we are going to pray because this is our neighborhood, this is our community, the school is financed by our tax dollar, and we want to pray. And so now they're a juggernaut. You see what I'm trying to get you to understand? So in the United States of America, the public schools have become the most powerful system of socializing people in the country. By far. By far. I shared with you earlier, 50 million children, 50 million children are enrolled in the public school system in the United States of America. And by law, they have to be in a school somewhere. And the public school is the only school that can finance educating them all. That's why this institution is so powerful. It's become so powerful. And what the church did made major mistakes when the church backed out of public education. And the first back out of public education was in 1954, Brown versus the Board of Education. There was a mass exodus of Christian people from the public school system because they did not want to see the public schools desegregated. If you go down in Virginia, this is lost in history. They shut down the school system in Virginia for several years, not days, not months, years in several counties in Virginia where nobody went to school over the desegregation issue. And so gradually the church has withdrawn. The second great withdrawal from the public school happened in 1962 with the Supreme Court decision, where the Supreme Court ruled in favor of Mary Madeline O'Hare, basically saying that there was a separation of church and state, therefore compulsory prayer in school was outlawed. These were major landmark decisions. And again, many Christian people packed up their grip, packed up their stuff, and they left the public school. Now the church is on the outside looking in at an institution that it's financing. So we're financing an institution with our tax dollars primarily from property taxes, 
basically to educate children, saying, we don't care what y'all have to say. And y'all opinion and y'all ideas are not valued. Is anyone listening to me? Did anybody go to that movie? Did anybody get that sheet that I handed out? Because you think I'm making this stuff out, up, and I hand you out a sheet from the National Association of Educational Progress, the recognized evaluator of public schools in West Virginia, in, in the state of the United States of America. And West Virginia's public school system is ranked, where is it ranked? 51st. 51st in the United States of America. We're ranked behind Washington, D.C. Now that right there is enough to cause you want to be insulted. We're 51st. We got a report of a D plus. Only four states in the United States got a D plus. West Virginia, South Carolina, Louisiana, and I think one state out in the Midwest. But it gets worse than that. Look at the list. Look at the list. The, they rate all the schools in the state of West Virginia. How they rank, how the schools rank. So we pulled out Kanawha County the four elementary schools that serve the west side of Charleston, they are ranked 399th out of 399, 397 out of 399, 387 and 378. They're at the bottom, at the very bottom. Our state is at the bottom nationally. Our community is at the bottom at the state. What that suggests, we got the worst performing schools in the United States of America. I'm not making this up. They shouldn't have wrote it down and posted on the internet. Nobody's paying attention to it. Our children, they don't even have a chance. Our kids are getting the equivalent of an eighth grade education. Unless they go to some of the elite schools up in Kanawha City, the elite schools uh, up in South Hill. Look at it for yourself, I'm not making this up. This is a tragedy. This is the unfinished business of the civil rights movement. It's the number one social justice issue of the 21st century. Our children are not being educated. And you know what we got to do? We got to start all this fancy stuff we're doing and go back and get them Sunday school books. And we need, every time we sit down with these kids, they need to be reading out of the Sunday school book. We don't need to be telling them the story. They need to read the story to us because many of our children cannot read. And the church historically has elevated and lifted up literacy. So on Sunday morning they need to be reading. On Wednesday night they need to be reading. Everything we do with these kids, we will have a book a Sunday school book where they're reading so we can help them increase their vocabulary, increase their understanding of what they've read and able to articulate it. I ain't mad at nobody. I know when I'm in a war. And I know when a whole community is under siege and this community is under siege and nobody's talking about it. And they're talking about the Capitol, about the state school board, about this audit, the governor's office, about that audit, but nobody want to speak to the fact. I told you, I'll give you the data. In Kanoa County, the schools missed, the kids missed 157,206 days out of school. Our school in the neighborhood, half the kids missed over 10 days out of school. And what's worse than that, the teachers had more absences than the kids. This is a mess. This is an absolute mess. We can build $20 million schools and $30 million schools, and our kids still cannot read and compute, and they're getting an inferior education. That's why I want you to see that movie. I want you to see it because at some point in time, we have to be sick and tired of being sick and tired and say we're not going to take this anymore. We're going to stand up and fight for our children. I got a vested interest here. My grandchildren go to school in this neighborhood, in these schools. Well, I'm going to stop before I get ran out to church. I'm getting ready to get ran out of Charleston. We've been working on this since 1998. Let me tell you this. Since 1998, if you want it, I will give it to you. I will create the timeline of our engagement in trying to work with these people since 1998. I keep every note, keep every email, keep every piece of correspondence that we've had with these people. They've lied to us. They've backdoored us. They've undermined us. We've been too polite and too nice to these people. We've been too nice and too polite to these people, and they continue basically to allow this situation to go on, at some point in time, we got to stand up and say, no, it's stopping, and it's stopping right now. It's stopping right, and this is the issue that can coalesce this community. Now, I'm just sharing this with you guys, because Reverend Elon and I spent a lot of time together, a lot of time praying about this, a lot of time thinking about this, and that was a test run. 
It was a test run, okay? I took $650, and I bought 100 tickets. He took $650. He bought 100 tickets. We said, we're going to see if we can get people to come. Because if they won't come, we might as well just shut down and just give up and say, we're just going to all be illiterate over here. And they came. It didn't cost me a couple hundred dollars because most people gave me at least five dollars on the 650 ticket that I bought. But it meant that much to us. We were saying, if we can't get people to at least pay attention to this and realize how important this is, and it's the future of the children that is at stake. So this whole situation with Mercy Snow, that was the test. That was a test to show these people we are not going to back down. We're going to stand up to you on every single issue. We no longer trust you. We no longer believe what you tell us. We have been naive thinking y'all would tell us the truth. And now we're going to challenge you on every single point. Public education is the future of this neighborhood. It's the future of this state. I'm not mad at them. I done figured it out. And I figured out if we don't demand more, we will keep getting less. Well, I'm out of my time. I could go on, you know that. But this pillar is badly broken. And we as the church, we have to engage. We have to engage. If we don't, we'll be in derelict in our stewardship responsibility when we know the children in the neighborhood where we are located are not receiving education. Do you know how many children that there are in the public school from the west side of Charleston? Do you know? Over 2,000. Over 2,000 children on the west side of Charleston. 550 over at Stonewall Jackson Middle School. 250 down at Grandview. 550 over the west side of elementary. Another uh, uh, 250 at uh, J.E. Robbins. And about the same number at Watts. And uh, about 350 high school kids from this neighborhood to go to Capitol High School, South Charleston. Just in this one neighborhood. The future is this neighborhood. And so in our elementary schools, uh, at the bottom, at the bottom, where are our children going to go and what are they going to do? Well, let me tell you this, and I'm really through now. See, I'm not making any of this up. It's all documented. It's all out there. But the west side of Charleston basically has become the epicenter for the state of West Virginia. Everybody is watching the west side. They read in the newspaper about the shootings and the crime bus. I was at WVU the other day, and I spoke up there to uh, some professors about the West Side, and they sit there like, I mean, on the edge of their seat. They think I was coming back from Afghanistan somewhere. <laughs> like I was been to Afghanistan and come back, and I survived it to come back and tell the story about what's happening on the West Side of Charlotte. They're watching. I was invited back. That was two weeks. Last week, I was invited to talk to the judges the 78th Circuit Judges from the state of West Virginia, and I asked them a simple question. I said, how many of y'all read the op-ed article in the newspaper about the west side of Charleston? 60% of their hands went up. Everybody's watching the west side. They know the west side story. They know the violence. They know the crime. They know about the poor performing schools. They know that 40% of all juvenile delinquents come from here. They know that 45% of all crime in Charleston is committed on the west side of Charleston. Everybody is watching. I got a call from the governor's office the other day. He said, we got another commission. Got another commission. We got to look at the overrepresentation of black kids in the juvenile justice system. I said, we did that in 2000. Why are we doing it again? It hadn't changed. Nothing has changed. All eyes are on the west side of Charleston. That's why when the Mountaineer Energy Forum, this is the American Petroleum Institute out of Washington, D.C., they come to West Virginia and they want to hold a community meeting. Where do they come? To the west side of Charleston. The Attorney General wants to do some more protection. Where does he come? To the west side of Charleston. You guys don't realize all eyes is on the west side of Charleston. He creates an incredible opportunity for the church to show that we have authority. And I'm going to close with this so you can understand what it is that I've been trying to do for the last 20 plus years. I'm going to tell you right now. For the last 20 some years, what I've been trying to do. First of all, is to establish authority. To establish authority as a voice of authority. That's why I've been on the radio since 1993. That's why I've read op ed newspapers, not about religion, but about education, about the criminal justice system, about the juvenile justice system, about the workforce investment system. 
to establish authority, to show scholarship, and to show that the church community can speak to these issues, to establish authority. And so by the grace of God, there's absolutely nothing special about me, absolutely nothing. My wife and kids, they will testify to that under oath. Nothing at all. But I believe that God had called me to do what I'm doing, to be a voice that had some authority, and to not to be afraid of any of these people, and to speak what I thought to be right, tape it so they could listen to it, and write it down on paper so I wouldn't be misunderstood. Yes, I said that, and it's written down to establish authority. Now, you know what I like now? I like now I don't have power because only you can give me power. So when I ask you to come somewhere and you don't come, I don't have power. I only have power when people show up. People only listen when they know that there are people that are behind them. We're in a position now, we have the authority, we have the voice, we have people's attention, and now we can demonstrate some power and have some influence that can help people. Let me tell you why this is important. Because the rank and file of everyday people don't believe the church got no power. They don't think we have any power to do anything but have a concert, have a chicken dinner, host a funeral or a wedding. They don't think we have any power to bring about any real consequence that would make any difference. And this is how I believe that God will credential us. He will credential us with authenticity as being his representatives. We've demonstrated authority and now we're showing some power to get some things done and we can connect with people in relationships. And those relationships serve as a bridge for us to share our faith and talk about Jesus and say we're doing this because we want you to come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. You can get a PhD, five master's degrees and a postdoctorate and die and go to hell and what has it profited? But we recognize that it is important to try to address the issues that people need to have addressed to show compassion, to show concern, to show some consideration to demonstrate some power. Now let me say this, lest I be misunderstood. I am not a politician. A politician would never say things that I say and certainly wouldn't write it down. I'm not a political wannabe. I'm trying to exercise what I believe that God has given to me, a New Testament prophetic voice to speak clearly and concisely to issues that oppress people and to show a regal carriage to speak to people in powerful positions just like John the Baptist did and say that's wrong what you're doing is wrong and God is not pleased with it if we do that people will listen to us they will listen they will listen don't think that they will not listen they will listen to us because they know that in the context of the church we do have some of the best ideas they know that but they don't believe that we have the courage to try to move our ideas forward. That's what we got to show these people. And if we do that, I believe that God will credential us. And we will have the power that's necessary. Now, I'm done. I'm going to take my seat. We've been dancing around churches. We got music that sounds like the best concert in the city and in the town. We got all these things going on. Look at our neighborhoods. Look at our neighborhoods. If that was going to change something, we'd be changed by now. It's not. What's going to change things is when we as Christian people penetrate inside of these systems, whether it's education, whether it's economic development, workforce, we penetrate this system and we try to influence it in a way that's more honoring to God. And that's what I've been trying to do for the last 20 years to establish a platform in which to do this because we are in trouble. We are in serious trouble. Let me tell you, when, when, when children don't want to learn, it is natural for kids to be inquisitive and to want to learn, 
And when they don't want to learn, and those of you who are educators here, you know I'm not exaggerating. A lot of kids who show up to school, their spirit is broken. They don't even want to learn, not interested in learning. Give me breakfast, give me lunch, and leave me alone. You've got a problem on your hands. Now let me tell you why I'm, I'm fiery this morning. Let me tell you why I'm fiery this morning. Every time one of, these, one of my kids get killed around here, it, it stirs me up, no doubt about it. No, no doubt about it. This young man that got killed up on the East End, I know his father, good friend of mine. I see his father almost every day. And I've known this young man, you know, pretty much all of his life. He murdered two people himself. One of them he tended to kill, the other one he didn't intend to kill, but both of them are dead. I wasn't surprised when I read in the paper that he had been killed. I wasn't surprised at all. This is just where we are, 25 years old. This is where we are. And that's why I'm so passionate about trying to reach these kids and try to keep them to engage in school and try to get them to engage in the church because they need our engagement. They need to be around us. I owe y'all 14 minutes. I will preach 14 minutes less next Sunday. Let's bow for prayer, shall we? Father, we bow before you moment, please.